Peter and John were going up to the temple at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which was an hour for prayer. Now, there was a certain man who had been lame from birth, and they would carry him along, and they would set him down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called the Beautiful Gate, and there he would beg for alms of those who were entering the temple. Now, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter, well, John too, but Peter fixed his gaze upon the man and said, look at us. So he gave them his full attention because he thought that they were going to give him something. Peter said, I do not possess silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he grabbed him by the right arm and pulled him up. And immediately the man's feet and ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright, began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All right, so this, this uh, you, you have to understand that the idea of um, begging and poverty is viewed differently in the ancient world. In, in our modern culture, when we see someone who's poor, the assumption we have is that there's something wrong with them. Why don't they get out and get a job, we say, or whatever. That we, we see it as, a, as evidence of a moral defect. And that's a characteristic of, especially of our American culture, and its origins lie in some theology that was predominant in the early part of the, uh, the 18th, 18th century and early 19th century. And it kind of led to this sort of viewpoint. I'm wealthy and do well off because God likes me because I'm better. So those who aren't are clearly not liked by God. But in the ancient world, uh, in the Jewish world, um, and I guess this is also true in some parts of the Middle East today in the Islamic world. But in the, in the ancient Jewish world, one of the things that was important was to, to give alms to the poor. It was considered a good deed, a mitzvah. And to perform a mitzvah is very, very important. But to be the person who receives the alms is also a mitzvah. You see, because I can't be blessed in giving unless there's someone to receive. So for a person to become the beggar and to receive that alms, that becomes a, a reciprocal blessing. There's a blessing that goes both ways. So they're, they're blessed in each other. We do see some of the same kind of concept floating around uh, in certain uh, traditions of Buddhism. There's what's called the mendicant. I can't say that word very well. The mendicant, uh, mendicant uh, monk who's a begging monk. And, but the reason that works is that when the monk comes and you, and you take care of the monk, 
you're blessed. And that blessing manifests in the next incarnation as a better situation for you. So this idea of the mutuality of the giver of the alms and the receiver of the alms and the way in which they benefit each other and bless each other, that notion is found in many religious traditions. It's just foreign to us as Americans. We, we think that when we help people, we're in that superior p position, you know. Yes, yes, I'm so good because I help. I'm so noble, I'm so you know, generous, I'm so this. So the job of being a beggar is not, is, is considered a noble job. But it, but it also is the kind of work you have if you can't do something else because, say, you're blind, or in the case of this man, uh, lame from birth. And so somebody has the job of bringing him to the gate and leaving him there. Maybe there's a guild Maybe there's a beggar's guild. I have no idea. But somebody carries him out there and sets him down. Uh, maybe it's just his family. Who knows? He might actually have a family, and they live on the proceeds of his begging. It's hard to say exactly how, because we don't know anything about him other than he'd been lame from birth. And there he is, though, at the, at the gate, along with all the other beggars. It's not like he's the only one there. He's got his spot. It sounds like it's been his spot for a long time. It's probably a problem if he gets there and someone else is in his spot. And he's like, that's my spot. And he's sitting there, and Peter and, and John come along. And they're just going to the temple. It's just that time of the day. And Peter looks at him and calls out to him. And heals him. Now, He's not the only beggar there. Kind of makes you wonder. Why didn't he pick someone else? I don't know the answer. And Peter's way of healing him is fairly aggressive, right? I mean, think about this. Peter says, look at me. You know, normally he would just toss some money in. Hi there. Look at me. Look at us, he says. I don't have silver or gold, but what I have to give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And then it says, and he grabbed onto him. He seized him and pulled him up. It's fairly violent. <laughs> oh! And the guy's healed, and suddenly he's j jumping up and down. I can walk, I can walk, and runs into the temple to celebrate and to pray. But you understand that Peter just forcibly made this guy unemployed just like that. In that moment, this guy is instantly unemployed and has no way of taking care of himself, or if he's got family, it depends on him, them either. That seems cruel. It would be cruel, except for the fact that the early church, the way it was structured, this early, early, early church, this initial church, was structured around the idea of the shared prosperity of the community. Everyone gave everything. They shared everything in common, and this enabled them to support one another. And then it meant that somebody like this guy, who had, who had no resources to bring into the community, could bring in something else that the community desperately needed. Well, guess what the community desperately needs? It needs the faith of the poor. James uh, the brother of Jesus, who is very, very important in the early church, talks about this in his own letter. He writes, he says, Do you not know that, though, that God has chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? And the point that, and he says, he talks a lot about this stuff in, in that little five chapter book, uh, the little letter he wrote. It, he talks a lot about that that God has chosen the poor, that there's a special blessing that God puts on the poor, and that we need that blessing. That faith is powerful. So this guy comes in with now not only a mighty testimony about being healed, but also an experience of faith. Here's a guy who has had to live his life day by day trusting in God to be gracious and to take care of him through God's people because he hasn't had the ability to do it himself. Now, this is really wonderful because um, one of the things it says in the Old Testament scriptures, that there's a, Moses says, when, uh, speaking on behalf of God, says, when you go into the good land that I'm about to give you, and you build your houses, and you harvest your crops, be careful lest you say to yourself, by my own power have I made myself this wealth, and forget that it is I, the Lord, who has given it to you. 
Well, for the poor person who cannot, because he's got no power or ability to do this, build it himself, right? He can't say, I built this. He knows it all comes from God in ways that rich people do not. So his presence in the church is a powerful witness of that truth. So he has something to do. And the church has the means to support him. Now this, by the way, is kind of a problem for us in the modern church, right? Because that's not always the case. I think about a guy who um, you know, had come asking for help, and I was talking to him for a long time, found out what his situation was. He didn't have a job and family, a lot of medical issues with the kids, had to, you know, so I was talking to him about working, and I said, well, you know, they, it just so happened there was a, a team working on the roof of the building, that, and so I, I said, well, let me talk to the roofers, maybe they can hire you, because, you know, roofers are always looking for work, workers. Well, no, he was, he had, he was afraid of heights, but also because of the medical stuff, the daytime was always when he was having to take the family around. I said, oh, what you need then is like second or third shift work. And he said, yeah. I said, let me make a phone call. So I made a phone call, and I had a job for him. So a company like Breakbush, where they process food, and what happens is every night you have to tear the equipment apart and clean it super thoroughly so that there's no bacteria and stuff like that. So it's a very messy job, but it's a very important job. And it's at a really, it's in the middle of the night, so it's not fun. I think their shift was like 11 to, you know, whatever, 4 a.m. or something. It was weird. Um, but I had a job for him. Starting pay was decent. Full benefits in like 90 days. That, inc that meant medical. So now it's, it's like a perfect fit because it means, okay, you're around during the day. So if there's a medical need, you have to take somebody to the doctors, you can do that. And you'll have health insurance in three months. So then you can pay for it and that'll make that even better. And this is good. He didn't even last the week. Okay, so now, uh, and of course, somehow managed to blame me for the fact that he didn't last the week. But here's the question. So I look at that, and I'm like, oh, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, right? But what would have happened if I'd had more resources? You see, if a guy grows up and never learns the reciprocal experience of work, you work hard. And two weeks later, they pay you money. And all of a sudden, that hard work is rewarded with money that allows you to buy stuff. And now it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a positive reinforcement system. But if you've never had that system and you're working that first week and you're not getting paid, you're just showing up to work, and no one has ever taught you, you have never learned that you hang in there for two weeks and you get money, and it just keeps working like that, what happens? How can you expect somebody to actually work? So what would have happened if, if I'd had the resources where I could have said, okay, we're going to assign you uh, some, some uh, work mentors, and what they're going to do is they're going to make sure you get to work. They're going to make sure that you're ready for work. You're there on time. They're going to pick you up in the morning and help you process the experience of work so you understand, you know, because if you come home complaining, they can say, you know, work is hard. And just kind of put it in context for you. And we're going to spend six weeks doing that. And then the next six weeks, these guys are going to call you up before you go to work every night to make sure you, you're ready to go and make sure that you don't have some kind of lame excuse and they're going to call you during the day, and they're going to check and see how things are going, and they're going to talk with you and talk you through this and support you until you finally have understood what the cycle is like and you can do this. What would have happened under those circumstances if we'd have had that kinds of resources? Maybe it wouldn't have made any difference, but I'll never know. So I hear Peter saying, I don't have any money. <laughs> I don't have any money. And I think, well, that's our experience of church, <laughs> right? Finance committee meets, and we go, how are we doing? Oh, well, we don't have any money. We're like this. Nose just above the water. If we hold our breath, sometimes when the waves go over our face, we're okay, as long as we just can get a catch of breath quick in between waves. We need more money. Finance committee says, okay, we got to talk to the uh, congregation, Finance committee says to the congregation, we need more money. Congregation says, oh, yeah, I need more money too. <laughs> Given all I can, wish I had more money. 
And what starts to happen is we start to see the world in terms of lack. I lack money, I lack funds, I lack resources. I lack stuff. I don't have it. And then I read the story here. And I read the story of Peter, and, he's, and he does this mighty miracle. And then as I keep reading in the book of Acts, because you have to understand that even though you just heard a little bit of it, I kept reading, so I know what comes next. It's followed by a mighty sermon where hundreds more are converted and saved in the name of Jesus. And then it's followed that by more healing, so much so that they would just like try to get people into the shadow of Peter, so shadow would fall on them and they would experience healing. Okay? And I'm like, oh my goodness, mighty power. I don't have that either. I don't have money and I don't have that mighty power. And I began to see the world in terms of lack. And God becomes the God of those who don't have anything and God of the God of nothing. Going, and the message of God is either, would you please give me money? Or, it's okay, we can get along without it. But either way, it's the God, not a God of abundance, but a God of lack. One of the most important things you need to learn in life is where to put your butt. As in, blah, 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 but blah, 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 blah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine that, it's, that uh, a, a couple have had an argument and it's time to resolve the argument and one spouse goes up to the other spouse and says, you know, because the argument got a little yelly, you know what I mean, yelly, got a little loud. So one goes up to the other, the other and says, I'm sorry that I was yelling, but you really made me mad. That butt's in the wrong place. <laughs> But what if they had said, you really made me mad, but I'm sorry I was yelling. Do you understand? You got to know where to put the butt. Peter understands where to put the butt because what the butt does is the butt acknowledges what you've said, but it also says that's not really the important thing in this sentence. Peter says, silver or gold have we none. We have no money to give you, but in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand and walk. The but acknowledges that there's no, that particular financial resource is not available, but Peter is not looking in terms of what he doesn't have. He, he knows what he doesn't have, but that's not, what, that's not what he's thinking about. What he's thinking about is what he does have. He sees in terms of resources. He sees, what can I do? Not what can't I do. What power do I have at my, at my fingertips? Guess what? You got the same name of Jesus to call upon. Now, I know we look at that and we go, well, he, could, he was healing people and raising, the, you know, raising folks up and, and they were lame and suddenly they're walking. But, you know, I was just talking to a woman uh, just the other day. Eight months sober. Doing her meetings. She was going to her meetings every single day. And uh, I guess over the weekend, um, she, was, she was a speaker at, at, at the meetings she goes to. She spoke. She told her story. She was an encouragement to someone else who was just starting down that journey. You don't think that's mighty powerful healing? Let me tell you, that's something else. That's, a, that's the lame person leaping up and jumping for joy. It was amazing. I was able, I, I actually had the opportunity to, to tell her how impressed I was with her work. The name of Jesus is still powerful today. It still makes a difference. We still have a mighty resource. Remember the old song? There's a bomb in Gilead. Right? Because we look around and we go, oh, man, Peter was healing guys, and then he preached that powerful sermon. I can't do that. And you keep reading in the Bible about these guys. Oh, Paul, he was so powerful in prayer. And John the Revelator, seeing visions. But what does the old song say? If you can't preach like Peter... If you can't pray like Paul, just tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. You have the name of Jesus. You have the most powerful resource there is. Can you find the prayer of response? Let's pray that together. 
I can't do those things. I can't raise cripples or preach to the crowds like Peter. I can't see visions like John. I can't pray like Paul. Or maybe I can and just won't believe it. Either way, I see my life in terms of what I lack. I lack the power to perform wonders. I lack the faith to change the world. I lack the resources to make a difference. My sight is dominated by what I do not have. So I am not mindful that what I do have is the most precious of all. No matter how inferior or how impoverished or how inadequate I tell myself I am, I have the name of Jesus to share, and there is no greater treasure. May Jesus' name be praised. Amen. Oh, Peter, go ring them bells. Peter. Yeah.